This is the lecture for the introduction to the Doctrine of Right, which is our first reading from the Doctrine of Right. And so we're going to start by talking about what is just the, the structure of this reading. So we're reading the Doctrine of Right. The Doctrine of Right is half of a book called The Metaphysics of Morals. The Metaphysics of Morals has the Doctrine of Virtue, which is the second half, and the Doctrine of Right, which is what we're reading the first half. The Doctrine of Virtue is about virtue, how to be a good person, uh, moral virtue, uh, unrelated to this course, uh, we're looking at Kant's political philosophy in this course, not his moral philosophy. Um, and so the doctrine of right is the political philosophy part of this book. And so what exactly is the doctrine of right? Uh, well, if you if we scroll up to part of the book that we're not reading, we get... Doo -doo -doo. We get a division of the doctrine of right. So this is the division of the doctrine of right. There's part one, private right with regard to external objects, the sum of laws that do not need to be promulgated. And that's divided into chapter one, how to have something external as one's own, how to acquire chapter two, how to acquire something external. Then there's the division of external acquisitions, which I guess is still a part of chapter two, which includes section one, property right, section two, contract right, section three, domestic right an episodic section, an ideal acquisition. Then we move into chapter three, acquisition dependent subjectively on a court of justice. And then there's part two, which is public right, the sum of laws that need to be promulgated, the right of a state, the right of nations, cosmopolitan right. For the first part of the course, we're mostly going to be looking at part one, all the stuff that falls under this. We'll spend a lot of time looking at part one. Part one uh, matches up to section two of the essay on the on the common saying that may be useful in theory but not in practice, which we've already read. Eventually we'll read part two of the Doctrine of Right, which matches up to part three of that essay, which we haven't read yet, but we're going to read part three of that essay. Uh, and so this stuff sort of deals with uh, like relations between states, and then this stuff deals with uh, sort of stuff within states and the founding of states. And so uh, now moving on to sort of what exactly is the project of the doctrine of right. And he explains it to us right here in his introduction. He says, what the doctrine of right is, the sum of those laws for which an external law giving is possible is called the doctrine of right. So what does that mean? So the sum of those laws, so all, all the laws put together, so add them all together. So every law for which an external law giving is possible. So what does this mean? So Kant has in mind the division between internal lawgiving and external lawgiving. And uh, what would internal lawgiving be? So in Kant's morality, which again, we're not looking at, what he thinks is the way morality works is that you sort of give laws to yourself. Morality is about giving yourself rules that you follow. That's the foundation of Kant's moral philosophy. So that's an internal kind of law giving. You are the lawgiver. Your own free will gives you laws and you follow those laws and that's how morality works. So that's not what this book is about. This book is about laws for which external law giving is possible. And what are those laws? Well, they're the things that we usually talk about as laws. So things that the state sends you to jail for if you violate the law, something like that. That's what external law giving looks like. Somebody else, you know, the government, gives you laws and you have to follow those laws or else you get put in jail. And so that's what this book is basically about. It's about those laws and also where does the government come from? Why does the government have the authority to make these laws in the first place? What sorts of laws uh, does the government have the authority to make? So that some of those laws for which the law giving is possible. That's basically the project in the doctrine of right. So that's what he wants to uh, sort of get going here. We're going to see what it looks like as we read it, of course. Moving on now to section three of the lecture, reason versus inclination slash desire and happiness. So th this doesn't come up a lot in the introduction. It really doesn't come up a lot in the book, but um, it sneaks in every once in a while to something Kant is saying uh, when he's talking about ends and means and unification and things like this. So it is good to sort of have this in the back of your mind so that you can refer to it to try to figure out what he's saying sometimes. Kant, in his philosophy broadly, and especially in his moral philosophy, 
he often divides things into two categories. So there's things that fall on the side of reason or rationality. And this is uh, sort of what the English word reason usually means. So when you use your powers of reason, when you use your rationality, you're thinking about things in terms of uh, reasons and you're being rational about it. So uh, when I say, what reason do you have for doing that? If you can give me like a reason, uh, some sort of explanation that makes sense of what you're doing, then your action is a rational one. So he, Kant thinks humans are special because we have powers of reason. He thinks animals, non-human creatures, and things like rocks and stuff, they don't have reason. They don't have rationality. They just behave on instinct. They can't sort of think through what they're doing. And in fact, the way he thinks reason works is that he thinks it's internal law giving. Basically, reason gives you rules, like you give yourself rules to follow, and that's how reason works. Animals can't do that. They don't sort of decide on some rules to follow, then follow those rules. They just sort of act however they feel. So that's what reason is, and that's a power that humans have. And then on the other side, Kant often opposes or contrasts reason with uh, what he calls inclination or desire or things like this. And these are things that you sort of want. They're like urges that you have. Uh, they're uh, goals that you have, not because you set these goals with your powers of reason, but because you just sort of naturally have these goals. Uh, so for instance, animals do have inclination or desire. They want all sorts of things. And we have inclinations and desires. You might have an inclination or desire to eat the piece of cake or something like that. Humans are special because we don't have to act on our inclinations or our desires. We can use our reason to decide, no thank you. But these are sort of competing forces or uh, alternate forces, each of which can drive us in certain ways and each of which we can act on. Kant often sort of summarizes or groups together all the inclinations and desires under the heading of happiness. So the thought is happiness is basically satisfying your inclinations, satisfying your desires. If you satisfy all your inclinations or you satisfy all your desires, you will be happy. Satisfying reason isn't like that. So if you do what's most rational, that's not going to necessarily make you happy or something. Like, a, rationality just isn't linked to happiness. Reason, desire, these are linked to happiness. So that's operating in the background, and it just bubbles up every once in a while in the reading, and so I thought I'd put it into a lecture somewhere, and so it just goes into this lecture as we begin to read this book. Now, diving back more directly into the Doctrine of Right, uh, onto part four, which is about right. So there are some key terms in this book. One is right, another, another two are hindrance and coercion, uh, and then another one is freedom. And they get introduced very early. So right shows up here on 386. We have section B, what is right? Then hindrance and coercion get defined uh, here on this page, 387. Uh, we have hindrance down here and coercion here on uh, 388. And then we have uh, freedom introduced, uh, not really defined, but used quite a bit all over, including uh, in terms of coercion and in terms of hindrance. And so all of these ideas, uh, hindrance and uh, coercion and freedom, they're all sort of interdefined. And so this is, first of all, to tell you pay close attention to what these terms mean and how Kant is using them. You really want to get uh, familiar with and develop facility with these terms because these are going to be some of the big important terms throughout this book, especially freedom. Freedom is all over. So that's the first point. I say especially freedom and especially right. This is the doctrine of right, so right is all over. Turning more directly to right, so we get a little bit of discussion of right in this footnote J, it's perhaps not as clear as it could ideally be. Uh, it points out that uh, earlier Kant used gerecht and ungerecht, justum and uh, injustum, for what is right or wrong in accordance with external law, and recht and unrecht for what is right or wrong generally. Within the doctrine of right, he simply uses recht and unrecht, although the context makes it clear that the only external, lo that only external laws are under consideration, in the present passage, the Academy edition capitalizes the words as recht and unrecht. And so what does all this mean? So there's a few things. Number one, strangely, our translation doesn't capitalize right, but Kant does. And so uh, 
what you want to be thinking about is right as like a special sort of concept or a special sort of idea. So like the idea of right, like the notion of right, the concept of right is what Kant is trying to figure out in this book. So in English, we don't really use the word like this usually. When we use right as a noun, we're talking about something like, oh, I have a right to free speech or I have a right to uh, immigrate or something. So that's how we use right as a noun. Uh, Kant uh, talks about these sorts of rights, so these sorts of rights are linked to right, but he's he's focused on something like bigger, like those kinds of rights come from the concept of right itself. And again, uh, or I mean, well, what is right? That's what you're going to learn in section B. So like this is when he first introduces this idea, but the first point to make is just try to get yourself in a mindset where right is a sort of thing that we're investigating and try to figure out like what is the shape of that thing. So have this in mind. That's the first point. The second point following from that is that it's very important, uh, you know, when we're talking about what is right and wrong and things uh, like this, we're not using right in a sort of very broad sense. We're not talking about right and wrong in sort of every sense of the term. For instance, we're not talking about mathematical right and wrong. Nothing in this book, the doctrine of right, is not going to tell you what the right answer to a math problem is or the wrong answer. Like when we use right and wrong in the context of math, entirely unrelated. And very, very importantly, when we talk about right and wrong in the context of morality, that's also not related. Remember, we're looking at laws for which external law giving is possible. That's the doctrine of right. And we're looking at things like um, what we might call uh, justice. So these are the Latin terms justum and injustum, which you know, got turned into the English just and unjust. So we're looking at sort of political justice, political right. Why is this important? What does this mean? Well, it's very, very easy to misread a lot of this book, a lot of what Kant is saying, by thinking when he talks about right, he's talking about moral right. No, 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 no. He's talking about political right. What is political right? Again, you'll have to read the book to figure out what that is. But it's not moral right. Political right is not the same thing as moral right. Moral right is about internal lawgiving. We're not talking about that in this class at all. Political right is about external lawgiving. It's about things like coercion and hindrance and freedom and the universal principle of right. That's not to say there's zero link between morality and politics, but it is to say you will very easily misread Kant if you read him saying as uh, as saying, oh, something is right, and that means, uh, you know, it must be morally good. Like he, as he points out here, look, the notion of right gets used in various ways, and it's we're not just reading off from morality what right is. Uh, we're looking at external lawgiving here. So we're looking at political right. It's a separate sort of thing for Kant, and you want to sort of keep your eye on the ball, so to speak, and uh, have that as the foremost concept in your mind as you read through this book.